and oh. Think you are live? Okay, and you are live, episode 34 with my strength conditioning coach, Don Heatrick. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, I had a, I had probably a bit different to you there in Thailand. I've just had a frosty morning with, uh, run with the dog at about minus two degrees, but it was a lovely sunrise because the the time of year. Um, but okay. yeah, a lot a lot colder than you, I think. <laughs> it's pretty okay here, but the pollution is horrible. I've never seen something like this. Oh, uh, we got that smog going on at the moment. Yeah, and in the beginning, I thought it was mist. That's yes. That. Yeah, I'm, I've never been out in Thailand when it's been like that. Actually, I've only seen like the footage from from you guys posting okay. it when you're out there, and it doesn't look good. Uh, training no, in I... masks and stuff, not because of COVID, but because of the smog. Yeah, yeah, but like at PK, we are lucky because we can run inside. So oh, okay, be, be, because they have treadmills. I know they run outside in the morning, but in the morning it's even worse because it's it's a little bit cold right now. So yes, do you know what I'm? I'm... I'm interested to hear what uh, the PK Sanchai gym's like, because it sounds like you've got some equipment there that I wasn't expecting to be available. To be fair, like, I've been in a couple of gyms in, in Thailand, and I actually got into PK on accident. I w it was never my intention to go there, because I was thinking that PK was going to be like Yokao, a little bit like a commercial gym where they don't really care about you. That was kind of the vibe that I always heard from Yokao. So I was like, okay, they have Sanchai, but I'm not going to go. And it's actually thanks to uh, Ogion Topic, one of your podcast guys. I had him on yes. as well, and I just contacted him, and he was like, just go, the, the manager is going to take care of you really well. And I was like, okay. After leaving Arachai, I was like, I need a new gym. And, and I went, and after the first session, I was completely hooked because their training program is so different. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, and you've been messaging me about that, haven't you? See how we can work yes. things in on with that. But it's it sounds like it it does suit um, a, a structure that allows you to kind of play in with with some of these other training methodologies yes. like strength so and conditioning as well. In the in the morning, the fighters train twice a day, and in the morning they run and they do some kind of weightlifting, but they don't hit pads or they don't clinch unless they have fights coming up and they want to. But that's yeah. normal. Oh, and they do knees. Like they love their, their 200 knees on the back and their hips. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that's that's about it the morning session with them is very relaxed I was very surprised by that to be honest mm. so in the morning rather than going to the gym I do my like well the strength conditioning program that you gave me so uh, that's that's perfect um, and aside from that in the evening this surprised me the most about the gym so you enter the gym and they expect you to run but they don't tell you how long you should run so you're free Okay. So for me, that would be 20, 30 minutes. I just, it's just a habit that I kept. Yeah. Uh, and then somebody will call you for the pads and you do five rounds of pads, four minutes. That's pretty harsh. Like it's Thai yeah. style. Like they, they kill you. Um, <laughs> but after, after that, again, you're free to do what you want. So you can come okay. and do pads. And like, I, I just drill a lot. I clinch too and I spar, but the majority of the time I just do drills. Right. Like drilling, drilling, drilling. Yeah. Yeah. I really love it. Sounds think, a good place to be. Mm, I thought about it. I think for some people, this would, would be a bad place because if you, if you go to a Muay Thai gym and they don't tell you what to do, people can fall into the, the habit of just throwing combo of the day. You know what I mean? Like, yes. or, or a, a reinforcing bad habits. I don't yeah. know if you are uh, familiar with uh, Barry Robinson. Yes, yes. Yes. So I, I do a lot of, I have all those programs and he gave me like a, a personalized program based on all those programs. And so I do, I do his program. I, I, my drills are based on that. But like, right. I, sometimes I see people in the gym and they rhythm step like every, every two seconds. Right. If, if you're from, yeah. And it's like, so PK is amazing, but you have to create the, the right habits. Yeah, then there needs to be some self-discipline there, I think, and yeah, some yeah. some uh, some a structure that you you're going to put in place yourself, perhaps. Yes, and also, do you watch UFC? Sorry, say that again. It do, just hiccup then. Uh, do you watch MMA, UFC? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Did you did you see the the Calvin Cater Max Holloway fight? Yes. Okay. So after that fight, I put on Instagram like, was was Max Holloway really that good, or was Calvin Cater's defense really that bad? Right. Because yes, and so a lot of people they contacted me and they were like, well, Max Holloway is just that good. And I was like, I don't agree. I I just think, with all due respect, that Calvin Cater made some huge mistakes, and um, Barry Robinson made a break made a breakdown, and yeah, of course, more into depth than what I saw, but. <laughs> yeah, but along the same lines, yeah. Yeah, but along the same lines, and I was like, it, it's funny how how people see fighting. They see it like they only think about punches, right? Yeah, and they don't think about everything else, like positioning, footwork. Yeah, it, it's yeah. so much about rhythm and timing, isn't it? As well, and distance. And it's if if you're able to play nicely with those, well, basically. It, put your stamp on things there and interrupt your opponent. That makes such a difference. It makes someone look bad. Yes, yes, indeed. And, well, this is this is an opinion that I have. Maybe I should ask Barry as well, but I'm going to put it out there anyways. Like, a lot of people who come to Thailand, they're blown away by, like, the Thai fighters. They have 200 fights, 300 fights. And, I yes, that that's absolutely impressive. But, like, they treat these Thai fighters as, like, Ma magical, even almost as fighting gods, and it's like they're just mm -hmm. so much better at the basics. That's the one thing yeah. I see over and over again. Like, yeah, if a kid comes to the gym in PK, they're drilling basics. Yes. They're really teaching them. Uh, and when foreigners come to Thailand, most gyms they go to, they just they will do do the same things over and over again. You know how it goes. Like you, you skip your shadow box. You hit the pads, you hit the back. And it's like most gyms that I've been to, they didn't really teach you unless you took privates. Because I understand, they want to earn money. But like yes. PK, is the PK is the first gym besides LHI where somebody was actually being like, okay, today we're going to do footwork. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting. I don't know if you saw the podcast that I did with uh, Tony Myers. Um, uh, but no, he I was. seen that one yet. So he was talking about how he would um, take really high performing fighters, you know, champions, and then after after a fight, he'd be back right. You're back doing basics, footwork, and and basically reestablishing some progress from them again because they've okay. they've kind of established that they're high performing, they're getting results, but. Mm -hmm. They're overlooking things in the basics, and he's he's saying yeah. that's what makes the champions. That they're very very good at the basics. So he said, you know, he's talking about Dean Dean James and uh, uh -huh. coming back from from a fight, and then be just making him work the basics on the bag again. And Dean's like, really? I've just won this title or whatever, and I'm back doing the basics. And he's saying it's yeah. that's the way to keep to keep that progress going. Otherwise, you just you kind of perform the same old tricks. You need to yeah, yeah. to be able to to make that foundation big enough that you're actually starting to grow again. And he's saying that's that's the way you actually progress. Champions is it. And I've heard this before. Being a, you know someone who's an expert is just ruthlessly good at the basics, and that's yeah. that is it. Yeah, I think the main example is a uh, Floyd Money Mayweather. Like love him or hate him, but he was amazing at the basics. Yeah. Yeah. And and it it makes everything else look so much better when the basics are intact but it's overlooked yeah. isn't it it's one of those things that it's almost you um you don't notice when it's right but you do notice when it's wrong and it just looks this yes. is terrible yes. I, <laughs> I agree on that you can see it with footwork especially i just think it's it just i mean i enjoy training footwork but i just think for most people training the basics is boring like for some reason most people think they master a jab, but for example, or just footwork. Yeah. But like most people can't step left and right. Like Barry Robinson is right on that. Most people go in like forwards, backwards. Yes. Yeah. And and even just playing with the timing of throwing that jab, you know, as to yes. how you're moving as you as you throw it, or whether you're throwing it as your opponent's coming towards you, or backing up, or, or all this kind of stuff. Um, as well as even the angles, just the timing of it, just it changes the flavor of it completely. And I, I see yeah. that quite a bit with fighters. The, um, you know, just 
if they're only throwing with one particular type of timing all the time, because that's their habit, and it's mm. that becomes, whether it's conscious or not, fighters begin to read that rhythm, and then the fighter that can change that rhythm, even with a simple technique, which is just a, a habit of footwork and timing and, di and direction, yeah. all of a sudden it opens up and it's like, oh, that was the same old jab, but it came from a different timing and a different angle, and mm. then it landed rather than the same old, the same old. And it's those going back to the basics that allows you to start experimenting with those layers on that. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, you have the saying, there's uh, a good jab will take you around the world. But like if you follow Barry Robinson's program, you have like seven, eight jabs. So imagine where you go if you have seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Exactly that. Do you, do you think that's like most people, they're kind of... They they have the same old habits like you said, and they don't have a lot of variety in their punches and their kicks. Do you think that's as the fighter's fault or the coach's fault? I think a bit of both. I mean, there's mm -hmm. I'm I'm big in that you know the fighter should take responsibility for their for their own progress, and if they're right. if they're not getting that progress, if they feel like they're just going out and and stagnant and doing the same old things, it's up to them to either, I mean it's down to personality traits that kind of look inward and see what you can do and start coming up with stuff. And I'm very much like that, but I know that's my personality trait. Other people are more external and need that sort of influence from other people. Um, so I, as a coach as well, myself, as well as being a fighter, I can see when a fighter's starting to become stagnant and then needs that external input. So, um, I can see that starting to happen and I'll create drills or, or give them, give them things to work with, um, that okay. will start to kick that progress again. But I understand, you know, that's, that depends on the environment you're in and language barriers and all the rest of it, you know? So when you're in Thailand, it's kind of the, the technique and everything is at that super high level. You're at, you're in that experience, but the, the kind of downside to it is the communication level unless you can speak Thai. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. So there's a lot, a lot more kind of learning by watching and all the rest of it and picking up that subtleties. And I think someone who goes out to Thailand has probably got to be, um, a bit more self-motivated because the, the communication isn't quite going to be there. It's more of a case of you looking for, for the, the little subtleties in what's being demonstrated and pick apart from just what's being shown. Um, mm -hmm how to kind of self-correct to a certain extent because you may be being shown because something's been spotted but you're not necessarily picked up on the application of it and all the rest of it and it's yeah. it's kind of your job to go away and start playing right what is the proper application of this it's, it's something i find interesting that um fighters that go out to thailand even if they regardless of if they go to different gyms it's different trainers in the same gym will show them different ways of throwing the same technique and they almost initially come away feeling like, well, the first one showed me wrong or the guy at home was showing me wrong. And it's like, no, it's, they're actually showing you a different way of throwing that technique yeah. that's got a different application. It's yeah. for you to understand how that variation of the technique is best mm -hmm. applied against yeah. what sort of opponent, what sort of distance, you know, um, all that kind of side of it. So, um, yeah, I think... I think it is a bit of both in, in other words, you know, with that, with that, keeping that motivation going, if you, if you're becoming stagnant, then hopefully the coach has spotted it and given you something to work on, but also, especially somewhere in Thailand where it's not going to be so easily communicated and observed anyway, it, it's, it's something for you to kind of stoke up yourself and, and look for ways that you can keep growing. It's funny that you mentioned that because in, in Thailand, they have a, a couple of different ways to throw the middle kick. And so a, a long way they were teaching me, you have to kick like up, like, like this. Yeah. And then somebody came to me and I was like, no, you kick like horizontal, you kick through the body instead of up. So I worked yeah. really hard to, to master that because it was like, it was like a weird change because it had a weird turn on his foot. And then I mastered yeah. that. And then I took a private with another coach and he is the first one that was like, okay, how you kick is good, but you have to kick up unless then it had to do with uh, the check. You can go over the check. If, if, you, yes. if you kick up, they can check. But if you kick over, you can go horizontal. I was like, okay. Yeah. Because most ties, they just say, oh, no, this is wrong. Yeah. Do you know what? It's, 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 it's interesting because the, the first way I was thrown to, to kick was horizontal, not cutting up. Okay. 
um, that was the first way I was thrown. But then obviously okay. saw the, the, the more diagonal cutting up version. Um, the, the, the reasons I, would, I was originally given for kicking horizontal was that if someone's got their guard up and their elbow's mm-hmm. there, if you're cutting up, you can end up kicking into their elbow and damaging yourself. Mm. Whereas you come across yeah. and their arm's there, you just clatter their forearm and start hurting their arm rather than smashing yourself up. Um, okay. and, and also, like you say, you can come in across the top of a, of a shin block if you're doing the, the, yeah. the check there. Um, but then it's a little slower than just diagonally cutting, bang, up. Mm. So there's different applications. As far as I can see, you know, it's the, there's that quick kick. And actually talking to um, Tony Myers in that previous podcast that I did as well, he's doing uh, an analysis, a biomechanical analysis on force development and and speed and everything of different um, rear rear limb techniques. So kicks, punches, elbows, um, knees, everything like that. And he was he was he was remarking on the difference between the kicking styles. So um, he he referred to it as like a, a quicker kick, which would be more that diagonal upward kick or one that takes a bit longer and there's more pivot on the, on the base foot as you're, as you're rolling in. Um, and he was, he was saying exactly the same thing, that they're, they kind of for two different applications. Um, mm. I was, I was trying to find from, because, because the research isn't finished yet, he hasn't got his statistical analysis done yet to kind of conclude anything. But I was, I was trying to say, is, is there more force from one than the other? Is, mm. is one a more powerful kick than the other? Um, yeah. And he's saying it's too early to tell yet, <laughs> but hopefully <laughs> when that research is out, it will give us an idea as well, which one actually creates the most damage um, other yeah. than it being just a tactical decision as to which shape is going to reach the target quicker or through the guard best. Yeah. But, uh, in regards to the horizontal kick, we have a, at PK we have, I think his name is Dead Dwayne. There's like a, there's like a highlight on Muay Thai Scholar of him. And he, he was known as the guy with the hardest shins in Isan. And I can tell you, when he when he throws a kick with shin pads, like, I feel it on my shins. It's like a baseball bat that comes. And he doesn't throw hard. But he says if you kick horizontal, you have to kick to the arm. He kicks, his middle kicks are very high. Right. It's very surprising. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't aim for your your uh, your ribs. He aims, he aims, like, just below the shoulder, kind of. Like, really. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can yeah. imagine if he kicks that, you're going to be like, what the hell is this? Yeah. I, I had yeah. One, one, of my, one of my fights. Um, the guy was kicking my arm. Um, mm-hmm. Mike Clark was his name. Real hard kicker here in the UK. Yeah. And um, I'd not had anyone. I was actually mismatched in terms of weight. It was one of those. I actually took the weight uh, too high. I, I was actually mm-hmm. like weighing in for a same day weighing. And it was actually a day before in the end. So it was like, oh, okay, I'm the wrong oh. weight category here. <laughs> <laughs> so he was he was big anyway for me, um, but um, he was the only one I fought that um, when he was kicking and he was catching my arm, it actually damaged damaged my forearm. You know, I actually bruised the forearm bone afterwards for quite some time. Um, there was months I was wearing my son's little because he was small at the time, little plastic <laughs> shin guards inside a, an ankle support on my forearm so I could spar because wow. every little yeah. touch on the forearm was like, oh Jesus, that's sore again. And there was there was no visible bruising, you know, it wasn't purple or okay. anything like that. But the bone itself was actually bruised, and it was just his shin clattering across. I didn't feel it at the time during the fight, but afterwards it was like, oh, I was wearing too many of those across the forearm. Um, yeah. Luckily, it didn't it didn't slow me up in the fight. But um, yeah, afterwards it was like, yeah, that's not a good idea taking kicks that were coming in horizontal like that across the okay. forearm, even though it was like boom, because I was used yeah. to just doing that, and no one had hurt me like that before. And yeah, yeah I, I learned that lesson <laughs> <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> yeah, as as they usually come, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's the easiest way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you how did you exactly get into fighting? Because when I started like doing your programs, the one thing that I didn't know was that you were actually a fighter before. Yeah. Right. So, I. I was relatively late starting fighting, to be honest. It was the, the kind of story with me finding Muay Thai, where, where I lived in the UK or where I do live in the UK, in East Anglia, there, there's not a lot of Muay Thai going on. Most of it's up okay. in, um, in north, you know, Manchester. There's, there's a lot in London, sort of, oh, the sort of south, southeast from me. Um, but in my region, Muay Thai wasn't there. So I actually did a lot of other martial arts first because Muay Thai just wasn't in my region. Um, 
And when Muay Thai did come to my region, it was actually through like a martial arts academy. So it was one of the martial arts that they were doing in in amongst um, more freestyle karate and all these other things that were going on. Filipino stick fighting, the screamer, all that kind of thing, stuff going on. Okay. Um, so I went there to learn Muay Thai after I'd done kickboxing because it was the closest thing I could find in, in the region. Um, but none, no one in our area was really competing, which was frustrating the hell out of me. So it was around sort of, I didn't start um, full on martial arts training until I was about 18. Um, before that, I dabbled with a bit of judo when I was like eight or nine, I think it was. Um, but then I, I, I found American football and that was the bit that I did up until I was about 18. Then I got into, into, um, martial arts properly. And, um, that was where I kind of shifted and thought, you know, what, I really, I really like this. And it took a lot of what I'd learned in my training from, um, American football, where we had strength and conditioning going on with that as well as part of it. There was resistance training sessions. There were, there were cardio training sessions. There was the, the sport practice as well. And then of course the games. Um, love the contact, love the game playing that, but going from that to a solo sport as such with martial arts, um, really loved that I got directly out of it, what I put in. So that was, that was me hooked then love the contact of it. Um, love, love the, uh, the tactical side of it, but say Muay Thai came relatively late because it didn't come to my area. And even when I did start to do in Muay Thai, the coach wasn't into fighters. It was training for the martial art itself. And I was ended up being um, a, a Muay Thai coach because I'd been doing it long enough with him. All that kind of stuff was going on. People were sort of asking me to to take sessions. So I started doing that. But all the time I'm thinking, I want to fight, you know. And there, was, there wasn't the opportunity around me to to do, well, in the UK we call them interclubs, the non-decision fights. Um, it was very sort of few and far between. My coach wasn't willing to travel anywhere and do anything. So every time I did one, it just felt like I was starting again. You know, every time I was like just as nervous again. Um, and, and that was it. I was in a little, little cycle there. And eventually, I think it was around the age of, I'd got to probably 33, something like that. And I was like, if I don't fight now, that window's gone. And, and yeah. I didn't want to sort of disrespect my coach. You know, I didn't want to do that. But he was like, well, if you want to do it, you're going to have to fight you're gonna have to sort it out yourself because he goes, I haven't got time to do it the weekends or whatever. And if you want a corner team, you're gonna have to sort that out. If other people want to fight, you're gonna have to sort those out as well. So I was like, not really what I wanted. I wanted to be shown how to do all this stuff. I've got no clue, you know? <laughs> and with hindsight, that's why he didn't want to do it because in terms of competitive ring sport, he didn't, he didn't know. So he was reluctant to do that. Um, and what he'd said to me was that, um, you know, his experience of fighters when it's looking at freestyle um, karate competitions and stuff like that, fighters fight, lose, and then they don't turn up and show up at training anymore and he loses students that way. So I was like, oh, well, that's probably because they're not being trained to fight properly. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> if they're winning fights, <laughs> the opposite happens. People train and yeah. there's someone to aspire and follow and all this kind of stuff. So I was like, well, okay, if that's, that's the way I'm going to do it, that's, I'm just going to have to do it that way. So I just had training partners come out and corner for me and I didn't know how to corner. I was literally watching everybody else to see, right, what do we do here between rounds and stuff like that? You know, how, how do we warm up for a fight? Oh, right. This is how a weigh in goes and all this kind of stuff. I'd never done any of that. Um, okay. but luckily, luckily I kind of learned quickly. And although I hadn't, hadn't had a lot of fight experience, I had a lot of training experience. So it's, you know, and I, I was actually coaching Muay Thai classes and all this kind of stuff. I just needed to know that, that last bit, an important yeah. bit though, <laughs> but that, but I did have a lot, a lot already going for me there. And, and actually in the first kind of year, um, competed as, uh, an, an amateur on the Muay Thai scene. I was, I was traveling to, to London, to Tottenham to do that. Um, I actually won um, three different um, area titles and different weights. Um, so I'd, I lost my first fight and then I just started winning. I kind of figured it out after that. Um, and I, on the back of that, I got chosen to, to go into the, the England team to fight at the World Championships. So okay. went off to Thailand, to, to Bangkok, to National Stadium. We were fighting in there. And um, that's actually where I really learned the craft of fighting as such. So... Um, I didn't have a coach, so I, I was allowed to choose anyone I, I wanted from the, from the England team, any of the squad. They said, you know, they'll help you out. 
So I actually picked the guy who was running the, the Tottenham gym, uh, a, a, a guy called Vinny Decon, very, very experienced fed up, absolutely love him to bits. And because um, he'd see me fight the most. And he was always kind of encouraging me when I came, um, even when I was fighting against the KO fighters from his same gym. He was always encouraging me because I think he could see that I was passionate about it. <laughs> and I was kind of learning my way through it as I was doing it. Um, yeah. So he, he actually cornered me for that whole thing. Um, and I got to fight three fights because it was a, like a knockout championship. So I, I won my first two fights. And then the third fight I actually drew. I didn't realize, being naive, I actually drew the defending two times world champion from Russia for my third fight. Um, mm-hmm. And they were all saying, no, it's all right. He's, he's not that good. He's all right. <laughs> so there's me warming up and got in there. And he, and he hit me and I was like, whoa, I've never been hit this hard before. First round, I was, I was all over the place just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. It's so quick, started so quick. Um, second round, I managed to, as he was kicking me, I th- stepped in and threw my, my rear hand, my right hand caught him. And he, he went down, got back up again. I was like, oh, I can hurt him. <laughs> and then the rest of the fight turned. So the first, the first round I actually lost massively, I'd say. I have to look at the footage again, but I just remember just being shell-shocked. He was so quick, just kick, kick, kick. And I was like, mm. I can't get anything off here. It's just breaking my rhythm. And then yeah. once I landed that shot, broke his rhythm then. I think I got his respect as well. He started holding back a little bit because <laughs> he, he just felt, okay, he can catch me. <laughs> and then I, I actually kind of took the rest of the rounds. And it was because it was the championship format like that it was just three rounds so i okay. he had kind of one i had two i mm-hmm. felt perhaps it was a little closer than that but um there was a split decision it went to him um so i kind of i got stopped at that say just shy of of having a medal but um i felt like i'd had my my kind of championship title fight there because he was the the you know the defending two times world champion but i did just stop short of getting a medal but i'd learned so much from that um and this this guy came over afterwards and he wanted a photo taken with me and everything and and Vinny Decon went you got his respect he said they don't have pictures taken anything with anybody those Russians you know so you obviously <laughs> gave him a good fight he liked that <laughs> as me stood there in the picture with his nose like big red nose right across my face <laughs> <laughs> but that was um and I I'm was always normally quite tall for my weight category but he was a bit taller than me, so it was in the. I didn't realise, but looking in the pictures afterwards, it's like God, he was, he was a tall fella. So, okay. <laughs> but that was that was really how I learnt the craft of fighting. So, um, getting that opportunity in the World Championships, really, to run through the process myself multiple times and change what we did, but also observing everyone else on the England team, but then also the other world teams, what they were doing, because we were all just set up in the in the outer ring, like a, it's almost like a concrete car park. It feels like a national stadium there. And they're all just warming up outside before you get pushed into the center. And there are the two rings going, you know, and there's the stadiums kind of set up. Um, But you could see all this going on and you could see what all the different coaches were doing. You could see what all the different teams were doing, which was very different. Um, And just cherry pick the bits that kind of worked. And um, that's that's something I've always been big on ever since was I knew which parts of the the warm up process, if you like, and the preparation before a fight and in between rounds, what, what worked for me and what didn't, and starting to recognize which, which elements not only work for me, but also don't work for others, even if they do work for me. And it's that respect, really, of everyone's got different personality traits and a different mindset, and you've got to kind of clue into that and help them shape their own personalized process for doing this so that they feel confident. Um, mm-hmm. And I just massively came back from that, and then I was coaching others to fight really, really nicely then. And like, oh, everybody's starting to get good results now. And they're not overwhelmed by the occasion. Um, and I think a big part of that actually is from feeling properly prepared. You know, if you're going into a fight feeling like, well, win or lose now, I've done everything that I needed to do to be ready for this. Um, it's now just uh, how this dance works out with this particular opponent because it's it's the styles that make fights and all the rest of it. But at least I know that I'm in a good place to, to actually go in and demonstrate what I can do. It's now who who has the timing on the day, who's got the rhythm, who actually manages to spoil the other person the most. Um, yeah. And I can, I can trust in everything else that's happened before. Yeah, I like your approach because I've noticed that, like, especially these days with 
with spirituality and the self-development industry kind of coming up it's like a lot of people are like oh i feel i've never been as confident and then you're like oh why it's like oh i visualized everything i meditated i did everything right and it's like okay but fighting is still a 50 50 game you have like 50 50 like you will see on the night like you can visualize for weeks like if it's if it's a mismatch or it, he's, he's just a bad matchup it all yeah. doesn't matter anymore yeah and and that's yeah. that having that kind of robustness i mean visualization i think is is great it is a really yeah. useful tool um and how the whole body kind of experiences and reacts to a visualization is the same as it would do so you can kind of work those those rep repetitive patterns if you like the, the habits really everything you ever do is a habit um so it's about trying to boil in the the good habits and trying to distill out the uh the bad ones that aren't serving you so it is a chance to do that but it is almost visualizing some some stuff going bad and how you're going to react to that as well because I, I do see fighters as well that especially if they're they're more kind of externally motivated there by what's going on rather than internally motivated they can kind of fall apart a bit when they feel like oh this isn't going to plan and what's everyone thinking but as soon as they start getting oh, into that yeah. cycle it messes them up um yeah. whereas if you can be more like my my i'm quite lucky i mean this i seem to have had the right mindset which is why i was quite successful quite quickly despite starting late um it was just because i didn't beat myself up if something went wrong then i just kind of wrote it off i always remember my first a class um pro fight that i had um i started off and it was the first time i'd done five three minute rounds first time I'm, i was doing elbows without elbow pads on so i was a bit like oh what's this one like again didn't have any experience from anyone else to sort of fall back on just had to kind of crash test dummy in it so i was like right it's five rounds it's three minutes um we start nice and steadily and we build up and i i my first first technique i threw through was a teep but it was way too relaxed and slow and i just um i just got my leg caught boom kicked out and i was down on the floor i was like brilliant this is a great start <laughs> straight down. literally first technique i threw bang i was down on my back and it was like yeah. but and, and but my my kind of attitude was i just jumped up and i just went right i'll give you that one clean slate start here and yeah. that it, i wasn't replaying in my head oh i just got knocked down first technique in front of everybody that was it was almost it was just written off and, and i was up mm -hmm. and it was like right fresh game okay this is the way it is <laughs> and i then in in that round then i then took him off his feet four times so i got him back you know it's like <laughs> and i'd almost written off that first bit so that was that was the thing um that i think could have unsettled me but it it didn't and uh it's it's the same in training um i see people that will mess something up in training and then rather than kind of beating yourself up about it it's more about just going okay let's just get that habit of right mess that up clean slate from this point on i'm going to try and be as good as i can now and every time you mess up it's like don't worry write it off game on again from now and uh, i think if you can develop that habit that's the bit that serves you really well and you can you can rehearse that with visualization as well you know like right if something goes wrong what am i going to do now and if it's if it's going to a little circle of just telling yourself off and just going, oh God, how, oh, and, and getting angry about it or, or whatever, that doesn't help. You've just got to be like, right, just fresh start from here, crack on again, and it's it's time for me to to kind of yeah. address this balance again. Yeah. Do you think that's that's a Western attitude rather than like a Thai attitude? Because like, I feel like for the Thais, they like fighting is is going like to Seven Eleven for them. It's like. It, it's so they're so used to it like if they lose five times in a row they don't really care but like in the west it's like oh i lost once oh, i'm gonna stop yeah I, th I think it's the the frequency that you fight obviously um makes a big difference so in thailand they're they're fighting that frequently it's not like gonna be that long before they get another chance again to kind of rewrite that history as such whereas someone outside yeah. of thailand is going to be fighting less almost like that that last fight kind of haunts them for longer. <laughs> I don't know if there's a there's a bit of that, but um, <laughs> you know. Um, but 
I, I would say that the yeah there there is probably a more of a generally more of this sort of um external extrinsic motivation with with a lot of western fighters where it's more about what does everyone else think rather than what do you think um and i i think well it's it's been shown to to be true that anyone who's intrinsically motivated tends to be more successful in the long run so if if you're more worried about your own performance and um doing your absolute best that that's that's actually what matters rather than the result um the the result is what it is it's what the judges see it's what the other opponent brings to it as well all of that stuff's outside of your control so if you just kind of yeah. let that go and i guess that's that's more of a buddhist kind of mindset as well anyway you know which you know thailand being a predominantly mm -hmm. buddhist country perhaps there is that kind of culture and attitude anyway that you know it's you mm -hmm. you you you're only actually in control of yourself and how you react to things so perhaps the, that's the mm -hmm. bit to to focus on and not externally what's going on maybe also just in general the, the Thai scoring system is so weird like I still don't understand 100% yeah <laughs> it's so different because yes. my last fight I so I I lost one on decision and I remember after the second round I sat down and I looked at my left chin and my left chin was huge that was like a huge hematoma and I was like, oh, well, well, I'm here. I might as well keep kicking with it. So it just got bigger and bigger. And so I lost that fight on decision. And I remember the first thing I thought was like, how did I do this? Because as soon as I stepped out of that ring and my adrenaline, I had my adrenaline go down, I couldn't walk anymore. So my first thing was like, wait a minute, how, how did I do this? And then my second thing was like, how did I lose this fight? I was like, he was on the back foot the whole time. And then the, the next day I asked, and like the head coach was like, oh, it's easy. You lost because you showed pain. And I look at my leg and I look at him and I was like, what, what did you expect? Like, <laughs> my leg is huge. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, in the West, and he was like, in the West, they don't look at that. He said, you have, Thai scoring is different. And it's like, okay, I understand. But why does nobody explain this? He's like, oh, we didn't understand either because of the gambling. And I was like, oh. Yeah, it's it's um it's a very different animal and it is kind of evolving a bit all the time because of mm. the the gambling and the, and the, the what the uh what the stadiums want to see and what the gamblers want to see um but yeah, yeah. referring back again to to Tony Myers he's the guy have you come across him before Tony Myers no, I I've, I mean I've I've seen some clips of him on the yeah. when you shared him on your Instagram but before that no I didn't know who he was so so his his big thing was um initially actually teaching people to well judge muay thai fights properly outside of thailand and that was a big changer here in the uk it in my opinion that's that's what brought the level of uk muay thai up so much more because before that people didn't know how to score fights so they weren't they weren't training mm. in a way or competing in a way that would win against a thai judged against proper thai rules you know so um there was that non that there wasn't this level playing field you know, coaches were only just uh, teaching fighters to do what they thought was right, which wasn't necessarily what the judges were scoring. So once he did that properly and rolled out a course here in the UK where um, people were going on a judges course and literally reviewing fights and scoring them. And, yet there was, um, and there were some really close fights that you were having to judge. And it was only if you scored a certain percentage, you, you'd then go on a register to be, then be able to be a judge here in the UK. Um, and then there would be a whole process where you're actually shadowing other judges for a while and all the rest of it. And he was, he, I can't remember what the percentage was he said now, but he was saying that the, um, the judging accuracy went up to like, I don't know, like 95% or something to match what the ties were doing. So all of a sudden, and, and this was the thing then, if you're then a coach who understands what scores and what doesn't, you can then train your fighters to have the habits that are going to win Muay Thai fights rather than just being busy but not not winning that, mm -hmm. almost like um, playing poker hands. It's like if you don't know which hand to beat which, which, is which hand, you don't know which hand to play. So, yeah. you know, you, it, that's that's a big thing, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that that um, being being aggressive, showing more effect is the thing. Part of showing effect is if your opponent's damaged or not. So that that if you understand that, then you've either got to 
know that I've got to play the poker face a bit stronger here. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, or I've got to start changing my game to, to use techniques that are going to be playing a higher poker hand than they are, knowing that I'm probably, now that I'm damaged, perhaps going to be showing that a bit more, especially, well, if you're, if you're leaking fluid, if there's blood coming out, then damage yeah. has been shown straight away. So it's like, oh, okay, I've, I've got to do something now, you know. Um, but yeah, I think um, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point, though. And especially if you're out in Thailand and you're not, not sure how that works, perhaps with the, the language barrier again, it might take a little while to kind of figure out what, what am I doing wrong because I'm equally busy. And this was something I've looked at at the research, actually, with um, looking at the difference between winners and losers in Muay Thai fights. And, and when you look at the um, athletic output of both fighters, they're normally about the same, win or lose. So the difference is who's more effective with the, the scoring criteria. You know, so if, if it's almost like you're you're both matching e each other in terms of effort levels, but then it's just so who who landed the the more cleaning uh, clean cleanly scoring shots or who had the most effect with what they were applying. So, you know, it's we we talk about sort of strength and conditioning and having the energy to keep up with the other person, um, mm -hmm. but once you are matched evenly at at your level, it's then how you play the game. So it is all your your strategy and tactics and Understanding the scoring is a big part of that. Do you know who has a who has an insane poker face? I don't try. Does he? <laughs> oh man, I I trained a couple of times at his gym. Like he's one of my favorite fighters, so I had to work with him. Sadly enough, he doesn't have a lot of fighters at the gym, and he doesn't teach a lot. It's, when you do privates with him, he will teach more. But I I sparred with him a handful of times, and it's like when when he's sitting down and and there's a break. You see him puffing, and he, he sits down because he's tired. But as soon as he stands up and it's time to spar, it's like, and he goes, yeah. and it's like, what happened to you? And of course, it's yeah. experience, but with him, it's on a different level. Yeah, and that's yeah. habit. That's habit. So it's um, that's someone else I was talking to on a podcast. We were talking about that habit of do you show your pain face? You know, so it's 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 a habit you get to rehearse in training. So if you're if yes. you're kind of hitting the pads and you're you're tired but you're showing it, that's how, you're going to do that in a fight. You know, it's it's yeah. almost an unconscious thing. But it's the same with any of your other training as well. When you're out running, you know, or even if you're foam rolling, doing your soft tissue work, and you're on a tender bit, if you're kind of like oh, grimace face all the time, mm. and showing that it's hurting, that becomes your your habit. So even when you're doing your foam rolling, you know, if you're just kind of like right yeah. inside, I might be screaming, but. I've actually got to get this habit of I just disconnect that. It does not it does not show here on my face or in my posture yeah. even. You know, that's what I'm trying to avoid. That, that's the one thing that I've noticed in PK. Like if you if you show that you're tired, they will make you work harder. So you just learn you learn along the way there. Yeah, and that's someone, that's the reason why. The trainers, yeah. Yeah, they they actually without without the uh, the language to explain, they're trying yes. to teach you you show you're tired because mm. this is what your opponent does oh he's tired i'll push yeah, the pace and break him then this is this is the time yeah. to finish him so <laughs> on the pads if you can show you're not tired and develop that habit your opponent can't tell either and you're not you're not calling them in to kind of like i've left the doors open come smash me up you know <laughs> <laughs> preferably not no <laughs> nah. you, you said you started late but like i mean the discussion varies, but like you were kind of in your prime when you kind of started competing on paper. 30s is mostly considered like as a prime. So how long until what age did you compete eventually? Yeah, I I actually um, my final pro fight was when I was 40 years old. So um, okay, that was and I I was still I was still in my prime then because I was looking after myself with all my other training. You know that was mm -hmm. my kind of um, my my unique selling point, if you like, for me as a fighter was that I was really, really fit. You know, I'd really well conditioned, strong for my weight and, and all the rest of it. Um, technically, because I didn't have the influence around me quite so much, I'd go out and borrow as much as I could to and learn and learn what I could. But I definitely wouldn't class myself the most tactical fighter. I was I was more that I could 
I could read what was going on. My, my sort of, again, the basics were pretty good. Um, but my main thing was that um, physically I could do what I needed to do to, to overcome my opponent. And that was still true even at 40 years old. So that was my final fight. It was just after that, actually. Um, th the reason that was my final fight was because um, an elbow injury that I'd picked up about five years in, uh, uh, earlier, actually. Um, I'd broke my elbow and I hadn't realized. Um, so I basically had bone fragments floating around my elbow. And every now and then I'd get a point where the elbow would kind of lock up and I'd be like, Oh God, what's going on with this? And then it would free up again. And I thought, thought I was getting like a soft tissue injury. So it was, it felt like one minute it was like tennis elbow. Then it was like golfer's elbow. It's different sides of the joint. Um, but it was going on for so long. I had to get it checked out and I, I had a ultrasound on it and, um, to try and see what the soft tissue issue was. And uh, I said, no, it's, uh, I, it, it, I'm doing an ultrasound here. It's for looking at soft tissue. But I can see even on this, there's bone fragments in here. I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> so I said, right, x-ray. <laughs> got the x-ray done. And it was like, yep, yeah, you've got bone spurs where it's grown. So it's quite old. Um, that's limiting the, the amount. You can flex your arm and extend your arm. There's fragments that float around. And when they get in the wrong place, jam your elbow, elbow up completely. Um, and, uh, it was like, ah, oh, right. He said, you've got to have surgery to get this sorted out. So I had the surgery done and, um, that break was just long enough for me to go, uh, I'm, I've lost conditioning here. I've lost momentum. I'm actually at the age of 40. It's really too old to be fight, fighting in Muay Thai. Um, perhaps ought to just focus on, on coaching now. Um, so that's that's really what happened. Once that was all healed up again, it was like, do I start the road of going back to competition? And in, in that time, um, I almost felt like because I wasn't competing anymore, it was more like, especially with my like my online coaching, it's more it's more like I wasn't competition anymore to other people. So it's more people were happier to come to me for coaching because I was now independent. I wasn't, you know, representing any fighting gym or anything i'd kind of come away from all of that i was literally just coaching as almost like a freelance coach um okay. i just thought that's that's probably where i need to spend my efforts now if i'm competing again um it would really just be for my own ego mm. i'd kind of done what i wanted to do aside from getting a professional a, a pro title i'd kind of um mm. i'd got to i was when i when i stopped i was um number four in the uk at my weight um i just thought you know what i don't i don't think i need to prove anything to anyone it's just like if i do this it's uh, it's, it's just being silly really so um I'll, I'll focus my energy now on 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 coaching and uh take everything that i've learned and just pour it into that instead so when you when you were fighting you would you made your own strength conditioning program Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's the thing. I've always been kind of independent like that. So, you know, I had to, I had to train myself to fight. You know, I was doing all my own stuff there. I didn't have anyone coaching me for that. Um, I just, I was lucky that I had some guys around me that were, that were good sparring partners and, and were open to experimenting with whatever I was doing as well. And we were just kind of helping each other out like that. And all the time, well, I always, always had that my, my strength and conditioning training was something that the other Muay Thai fighters weren't doing anyway so you know everything I was doing there was just an advantage um I, I was always really good for my weight category unless I'd been stitched up and put into a fight where I it was uh I was told it was the same day weigh in and then it turned out it was a day before or something like that that was the only time I got it wrong um but yeah that that sort of side of it um I've, I've always um trained myself that way and but been good at going and getting external influences from all around the place when I needed to and, and uh, actively searching that out. How did you, did you figure out the strength conditioning part? Because like most gyms in, in Thailand, and I assume a lot of Western gyms do this as well, they're high on running, like just mm. miles and miles and miles. While, well, for my program, it's basically the mass, the mass sprints and yes. strength conditioning. And that's like a different approach than most gyms so how did you come up yeah. with the sprints rather than the the runs even even if it's not the long run yeah so it 
it's all about the strength and conditioning is supplemental training. So I'm looking to do anything that's going to bring some sort of fitness development that you're not going to get in your ordinary Muay Thai training. So I'm not going to double up on any of that, especially if you're out in Thailand, you're doing so much of that already. I'm just looking for the bits that are going to bring some sort of fitness adaptation that's missing already. Um, so already if you're, if you're out doing the steady runs, although we do start with that initially in the program because we need to build that aerobic capacity base, um, it's more about aerobic power. So with, with the conditioning side of it, um, the way, the way I look at it is that you've got aerobic capacity, which is almost like your reservoir of energy. So we need a big volume of water of, of aerobic power to build from of a, a, a big capacity that is almost like your dam. So we need, we need that there. If you've got a small little dam, if we, if we provide a lot of power quickly, it's going to drain it real quick and it's empty and you, you're gassed out. So we need a big, big reservoir of water. Aerobic power is more like floodgates in the side of the dam. So you could have a massive, massive dam, but if you can, if you've only got like a little pin prick in the side and it's just coming out very slowly, you can't deliver that energy very quickly. So then we need to be able to open up floodgates to deliver that as quickly as we can. So we need that balance between the two. You need the, need the reservoir. You need to be able to get it out quick enough to actually fuel the, the energy systems that you're doing. So the, the, the different ways of training train those different aspects. So the steady state stuff is more about building the reservoir up and the, the sprints and repeat sprints are more about building up the power element of that so you can de- um, deliver it quickly. That side of it came from just a lot of research. So um, I've, I've seen it done badly. I've seen fighters gas out where they've done. They basically worked far too many kind of sprint type um, activities with not enough rest. So then their body turns into one that de- de- um, depends more on the, the lactic energy system rather than the aerobic energy system. Um, okay. the way to look at it when, so I've done lots of sort of research on fights. You, you do, when you do strength and condition, you do what's referred to as like a needs analysis of the sport. So you break down what are the work and rest intervals, how many, how many rounds are there? What are the rest in, intervals in between, um, in a particular round, what are the bursts of effort? Like how long are they? How long are the, the sort of rest periods where you're just kind of jockeying around and circling around each other? what are the types of movements you're doing, what are the speeds that are happening, all this kind of stuff. You break it all down and then you, you then look at what those demands are on the body and then you develop a program that satisfies that for that particular sport. And then you also measure the individual and compare them and look at the gap between the two and you, you provide a program that fills that gap and brings them where they need to be. So fighting a Muay Thai in particular um, is a really interesting sport to program for because it's difficult <laughs> there are so many different things going on and i think that's why why strength and conditioning has kind of got a bad rap in in muay thai circles because it's easy to kind of mess people up with it rather than make them better with it so you you need okay. to understand what you're doing with all of this if it's if it's done badly it does all the things that like traditionally people say it shouldn't do it's making people sore and tired it's making them bigger and bulkier and slower and all this kind of stuff whereas actually you can make someone well leaner if you get your your your, um, your nutrition right as well but it makes it puts your power to weight ratio up your strength to weight ratio up you're faster mm-hmm. and all these kind of things but also more robust so that you're not going to get as easily damaged so you're all these overuse injuries and patterns are balanced out so you're holding together really well you basically your body armor is up and you're able to tolerate all this stuff. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of research. I've not had really any um, direct influence on that either. You know, a, a bit like everything in my Muay Thai career, I've just gone out and figured it out, put something together, tried and tested until I found something that worked. Um, I think that all comes from my, my background being a mechanical design engineer before I decided to do all this. It's all about sort of planning and preparation and figuring, thing out, figuring everything out, testing to see what works and adjusting based on that. So that's, that's really what I've done. I've, I've looked at different sports that do different areas of these, um, the preparation better. Um, I mean, my, my kind of history with originally doing American football, that was actually looking back really good because that was a sport that already had this philosophy of you don't just do the sport. You do stuff in the weights room to make you a better athlete um, as well. 
So that sort of part of the puzzle, I'd already been doing that since day one. And I kind of did that when I was doing my Muay Thai training when other people weren't around me at all. Um, and I could see the benefits of that. And I'd just done the same thing with the energy system stuff as well. And just really dug deep onto that and just seen exactly what do we need to make a fighter better? How does it work specifically for Muay Thai? What are the elements of training that we should be doing more of compared to less of what bits are already being satisfied by your general Muay Thai training anyway? And what bits can I add to it to change the fighter to make them better at what they're doing and not just give them more of the same? Now you have been in Thailand yourself. You worked at Yoka, I think, if I recall correctly. How yes. Did, uh, how did the Thais react? How did the Thais react to you implementing like a different way of strength conditioning for them? Because like mentioned before, for them, it's like, oh, I run 10K in the morning, <laughs> I lift some random weights, and then I run 5K in the, in the afternoon and do my Muay Thai twice a day. Yeah, so the the reason for going out to Yokao was to to show them some things, but also for me to to gather, gather some data. So I was I was measuring and okay. testing the fighters to see. Um, this is this is the thing. So um, everybody assumes that the 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 ties are very strong, very powerful, um, and very aerobically fit. And I wanted to go in with some tests that I run with my fighters online as well, and run these fighters through those to see how they measure up and to see if they really are as strong and as powerful and as fit as you think they are. Um, mm -hmm. So that was that was my main reason, but then also to show them some things. And um, it was really interesting, actually, because the, I mean, I mean, the strength and the power bit in particular, as I was expecting, they, they weren't at all because then they're, they're not actually training for strength and power. It's more um, power endurance is what they're doing all day. They're not training yeah. raw power, not training raw strength. So that part of their right. equation isn't being boosted up. Um, mm -hmm. So when I tested that, that's that's exactly what that showed. You know, they they were not that strong really. They were it was and and even with with the power, I had like repeated jumps, measuring those and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I sort of did it for a short spell, and then I did it for endurance as well. And as soon as you get them working closer to their maximum. They fatigue really quickly. So what they are is um, very efficient. <laughs> they're not. They're not actually. <laughs> they're not very um, strong or powerful. But what they do do is they're very efficient with the movement patterns they've got. So all of that repetition, the motor pattern rehearsal that they do, yeah. they're very economical with what they throw. So I've got this kind of three-step little process in my head. I've got to 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 generate the most impact on a target. You've got initially starting at one end, the, the amount of raw power and strength that you've got that you can throw into, into the technique. Then you've got the efficiency of the technique itself. So if you're really efficient, closer to 100% of what you put in comes out the other end. Most Westerners are probably, if they've been doing some gym work, I've got more strength and power than the ties have, but their efficiency okay. bit in the middle is very, very poor. They waste a lot of their effort going going in the wrong way and it doesn't come out in the strike they're too tight they're not relaxed as they're throwing it the ties aren't very powerful but they're super efficient in the middle not a lot of it's wasted with all the years and years and thousands and thousands of repetitions they have a lot of what they throw ends up hitting the target so that's why they seem more powerful if they then took the efficiency they've got if they just mixed in some strength and conditioning stuff to actually boost those levels up so their inputs even higher It'll be even greater, but they they don't realize that yet. <laughs> so that's that's our advantage at the moment. It's a way we can kind of catch up that if if we're never going to be able to match the efficiency they've got, if we can up the raw input a bit more, then we can match the the output in in damage in in the uh, the the end result. But um, yeah, so when I when I went to Yokao, I was sort of collecting all this information, but it was it was very interesting because they had a mixture of um, Western fighters there that I could communicate easier with. And then of course there were the Thais like uh, at the time, Manichai and Sing Dan were there. Um, Yod Chai as well. And um, they were, they were more skeptical of what was going on. The, um, Sing Dan was very good actually. Sing Dan was like, oh, right. I'm interested in what you're doing here. Uh, and he was, okay. he was kind of, he was, he was very up for it. 
you know he wanted to he wanted to ace all the tests and all this kind of stuff as well <laughs> um, the others were more kind of looking sideways through their eyes going this guy just wants me to do more work um and he's going to make me tired and now i've got to go back and go on the mm. pads and i'm going to get beasted again and all I'm looking to do is get through my working day, to be honest. You know, that, that was the kind of attitude that I could pick up. You know, it's like I, okay. I do this six days a week for hours and hours and hours. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking to clock in, clock out and do what I need to do to keep my trainers happy and not be absolutely exhausted. And if you're coming in and getting me to do some stuff that I'm not familiar with, um, that's, that's making me feel tired because I'm not actually used to putting in as much effort as it looks like I am because I'm super efficient. I've been doing this since I was six or something. My economy is mm-hmm. great and I can actually just keep going and I look like I'm working hard when I'm not really. <laughs> when I was actually pushing them to their limit, that was, mm-hmm. that was interesting. You could see that uh, this, was, this was not something they were accustomed to. So, for example, you, you talk about the, the, okay. the MAS training session, sessions there. Um, maximal aerobic mm-hmm. speed it's like a, a shuttle based system that was something I did with yeah. with them with the ties to measure their um, their VO2 max to get their, their aerobic their aerobic power sort of output measured and because it's a shuttle run so it's it, as you as you you know you've done this there's a five minute test where you just shuttle at least sort of 20 meters I like up and down bam, 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 and you just get as many shuttles as you can do in five minutes and that's that's the test. So that's I got I got all the ties to do that as well. But um, the next day after that, there um, there's Manachai and and Singdam going. Oh, legs are sore. Legs are sore. Can't kick. And I was like, what? Really? You know, from a five minute shuttle test because they weren't used to the stop, change direction, turn, yeah. and they were trying to do it quite quick. And it was yeah. just it was a novel novel stimulus to them. And it was to me it was like I did not expect that to make someone who trains as much as they do saw yeah. when I've got people back home that do hardly anything apart from yeah. just some strength and conditioning, they could do that and they wouldn't be sore the next day because we're loading them and their bodies are used to this. So that was a real aha moment that, um, yeah, do you know what? The, the ties are just that you're either adaptable or you're adapted. And I always want athletes mm. to be as adaptable as possible to tolerate lots of different um, stimuli uh, to, and be able to mm-hmm. to cope with it and grow from it when you're adapted you're kind of used to seeing what you're seeing every day and your body's just going yeah got this already i don't need to get better and most of the mm-hmm. ties are at that point where they're just yeah this is what we do and they're, they're just looking for those technical mm-hmm. and tactical bits that they can perhaps sharpen up in between okay. but if if they had this mindset where like um like anyone who's doing strength and conditioning has got that we're constantly trying to cycle through and take that cycle higher and higher and higher we just if if our body is adapted to it we're shifting the stimulus in some way to to get more out of ourselves to go higher um whereas that's that's not the the Thai method they and it's because there's a there's a ceiling on it that if your if your method of progressing training is to just to do more rather than change it to be a bit clever and and, and make it more novel or overload in a different way if you're all you're doing is doing more there's only so many hours in the day and that's mm. that sounds like the Thai model now doesn't it it's like you're just doing what yeah. you're doing and cranking it out every day um and the progress reaches a point and then athletically stops technically it can still keep improving improving because you're you're repeating the move the motor patterns but um yeah. athletically there's a limit and it stops and um, I don't think there should be an athletic limit. You should still be trying to push that all the time. And if you're clever with your training, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Kind of surprised that Man- Manachai was sore. I've never seen him in real life, but like mm. seen him on video. The guy looks like he has three trunks for legs. Yeah, he does. He does. And he's he yeah. actually moved really well. His mobility was good when we checked all of that. Um, although he'd okay. never never done a squatting pattern he got it just like that and he, or everything moved really well mm-hmm. um but yeah he's one of the, one of the things that was happening actually um they were using heart rate monitors and th- this is one of my i, I did a video um yeah. sometime afterwards actually just to explain this because um the coaches were trying to they had the the heart rate display of the different fighters up on a on a big screen they had like the polar team set up going and um they were pushing Manachai to try and reach um, a higher heart rate. 
and they were trying to get him to like match someone like Sing Dam or someone like that. And I was I was trying to explain and again with language barrier. I was trying to explain that you can't do that. That genetically everyone's got a different maximum heart rate, so the percentage of mm. um, that you're pushing them to is different depending on each individual. You actually need to know the maximum heart rate of each person, and then you've got a better idea. Um, so they were trying to push Manachai to reach the same maximum heart rate as as Singdam, but Singdam's I could see Singdam's heart rate naturally revved higher than Manachai's did. So you know Manachai at 186 okay. was closer to his 100% maximum. 186 for Singdam would have been more like his 80, 85% or something like that. So they were. Okay. <laughs> it was one of those examples of you taking a tool like heart rate monitors to try and. Um, improve fighters and they were basically just mm. pushing Manachai too hard and they're going to make him overtrain mm. and I could see he was at that kind of stage where and it, this was this was actually before he um, he had that little hiatus didn't he from from training f- for a little oh, while I remember that yes yeah and yeah. it was just before that and I think that might have been part of it is they were just they weren't realizing that they were perhaps pushing him and he wasn't able to recover because the tool was not being used in a way that was actually actually that effective. So if if you can understand that um, maximal heart rate isn't something that uh, re- reflects how fit you are, it's a genetic ceiling. It's resting heart rate that reflects how, how fit you are. So the lower your resting heart rate, the more aerobically fit you are. But you're never going to change the top end. That's just you rev to where you rev. Um, and that, that's that's the bit to understand. So if you're if you're playing um, heart rate top trumps with your with your mates, that's with exact beats per minute. You're not on a level playing field there. That's that's going to mess things up. Do you think that the ties are catching up now though? Because like, well, Serechai is kind of everybody says he's out of his prime. I don't agree, but Serechai has been in, in the, the kickboxing top for a long time. Now we have Superbon coming, Superleg is coming. Uh, well, I oh, fought yesterday, two days ago. Captain Pitch and Deal, pretty good. I think the ties yeah. are 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 catching up, or do you think it's still kind of what you mentioned before that they're still more efficient? Yeah. So the, there are certain gyms that are starting to apply this the, the supplemental training, strength and conditioning, these kind of things properly. Um, and can afford to because there's equipment to invest in that takes up space in the gym as well um that but the other thing is kind of like we've we've been explaining it's easy to kind of mess it up with the strength and conditioning so you need to know what you're doing because there are so many different things we're trying to balance Mm -hmm. up and there's it's a sport where there's no off season as well you're continually fighting so it's easy to Mm -hmm. kind of take people the wrong way on it um Mm -hmm. it's so it's having someone who can program that training effectively as well and manage it for lots of different fighters that are uh, different stages of a fight camp and all this kind of stuff. So you need the equipment and you need the knowledge really to put the program together. Some of the gyms are starting to get this now. Um, mm. And those fighters are starting to to change as a result. So they, they are going to start having this, what I'd refer to as like a, a good blend between that raw athletic input and that economy and efficiency of movement um, that's all starting to come together. And those fighters that are able to balance all that up properly are going to start kind of lifting higher and higher up on that on that world stage because there, mm-hmm. there is a general kind of catching up, isn't there? That is starting to happen. More of the Westerners are starting to experience the technical and tactical training that the Thais uh, uh, yeah. uh, had the advantage of for so long. That's starting yeah. to level off a little bit. Um and there are more trainers, there are more fighters that have now got full-time gyms that they can work at as well. Um, so it's it's a natural thing that's going to evolve. And there are different disciplines from from different areas that can all add to a fighter's potential. And it's, it's seeing the crossover from some of this stuff. And even if it's not traditional, traditional, actually seeing what value it has and, uh, and actually um, welcoming welcoming that in and seeing how that fits in with the best of the traditional you've already been doing, because a load of that stuff's really good, but then just piggybacking in and swapping out some of the areas that don't serve so well. And rather than just doing a whole load of filler on, on training sessions, actually just, you know, like, like you've saying there at PK Sanchai gym, 
a couple of lifting sessions in the week. It's like that's bringing something in that was missing before. And as long as you're balancing everything up and it's recovering, that's that's good. Um, but it's just going to take a long time for obviously like grassroots gyms in Thailand um, mm. where they haven't got the knowledge, they haven't got the money for the equipment, they haven't got the space. Um, it's just it's not going to make it there. But it, the uh, the bigger the bigger gyms are going to be able to to take all that on. Now you talked about uh, gyms buying equipment. One of your programs, and that's why I started using your programs, is the, the minimal equipment program with TRX. Uh, I personally chose it because I don't really like lifting weights. It's like it's something personal because I injured myself when I was doing fitness. And uh, do you think that that fighters who use the TRX or body weight rather than than free weights or machines are selling themselves short in the end? There's there's only so much overload you can achieve with with body weight or using a TRX. So. Um, when I, when I put that program together, the minimal equipment program, it was for, well, guys like in your position where you're at a gym, there, there are no free weights um, or you need to do any training directly in front of your coaches so they can see you're actually working rather than you've disappeared off someone else, somewhere else to do your, your uh, weight training and they're kind of like, oh, didn't see you training today. <laughs> and it's something you can kind of fit in really easily around everything else you just need like a if they've got a chin-up bar or something or, or even a bag bracket you can lash it up on there and, and you can get on you don't need anything so it was a way for me to at least um maintain uh, athletic qualities that i've had fighters already training using um the full spectrum of tools if you like but you absolutely can do a really good job as you as you found with a trx if it's programmed well so the main thing is the, the areas we're looking to hit in a training session, um, other than the, the all the sort of mobility and the activation sort of warm up type stuff, you need an element of speed, you need an element of um, power, and you need some strength training. And that, when you look at that, that's all resistance and relative speeds of movement, velocities of movement. And if you can mm -hmm. program exercises that hit hit the right velocities and and relative resistance levels, then you're you've, you're putting together a really good program there. So that was what I wanted to do because I'd not seen anyone had done that really with a TRX. It was mostly kind of just circuit training and it was muscular endurance work. That's that's what people were doing with it. So I deliberately went in, experimented and measured some movements and velocities and stuff like that as I was sort of performing different activities with the with the TRX and looked at the different movement patterns I wanted to hit. Um, and that's that's what I put together and that's what came out in the, the TRX suspension training part of that minimal equipment program. Um, there there's only so many ways you can progress it in terms of you know whether you're doing it two limbs single limb whether you're making it more unstable with a trx whether you're adding pauses to make it harder and stuff like that once you've kind of maxed out then you you need to to kind of shift things around again but actually the, the number of variations you've got with that um do allow for a lot of progress even th running through the same three blocks of training as such so um it's not selling yourself short. Um, I very much had it in mind that it was a temporary stopgap, but I'm finding people are using it for a longer and longer period and still getting better and better from it. So I'm really pleased about that. That's a bit of practical testing that I wasn't expecting it to be as good as that. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a, a happy side of a side effect of it. Um, mm. Body weight only is difficult. Um, the, the big one with body weight only is that the pulling pattern is really hard to do if you've got nothing to hang from. You can push as much as you like, you know, um, push-ups and um, handstand push-ups if you want to go for like maximum strength in a vertical pattern, single arm push-ups on the, on the horizontal. Um, and you can start adding things like weighted vests and things like that as well. But the, there, is a, there is a limit and the, the pulling, you at least need, really need like a, a chin-up bar or something to hang from. To, to give yourself uh, a proper pulling pattern. Um, but it's, it's just you're more limited to the variety of different patterns and loading that you can achieve. So it tends to serve a shorter window of development because mm. that adaptable, adapted bit, once your body is adapted to it, unless you're changing things around a little bit more, then it gets stagnant and you, you're just maintaining progress even if you're still working equally as hard. Your body's it's just not a novel st stimulus anymore. So there, there's definitely a limit to it, but it's, it can serve a purpose for a period of time. Okay.
Okay. So eventually, for the people who have the, the TRX program like me, it's better to shift to, I assume, your heavy hitters program? Well, yeah, that's that's like the full program I've got. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the heavy hitters program is is really just my, what I refer to as like um, my long term lifetime strength and conditioning program. So mm -hmm. in there at the moment, and I've got more to add to it, I'm kind of keep doing this to it, but um, there's what I call three complete phases of training. And when I say a phase of training, it's almost like a, another, another name for that would be like a fight camp, if you like, which is typically sort of 12 to 16 weeks big end where you've got mm -hmm. full mobility and movement first and leadings right through. Then what would I'd officially call a fight camp, which would be strength block, power block and speed block. And then we go through again and then again. And there's basically three different complete phases in there that are completely shifting the exercises you go through. We start with more, a bit like, like Muay Thai. We start with the foundation bits and then we add to it and we add to it and we sophisticate movement. So it's, it's almost like gym skills as much as it is um, the, the conditioning side of it and the strength side of it. So the, the movement patterns get more sophisticated, get more difficult to control. So for example, um, a power exercise in phase one could be a heavy kettlebell swing or a squat jump where you're loaded on that. And um, that's going to give us the power development if I've loaded it in the right way to get the velocities that I want. So that's all kind of figured out for you. But then at the other extreme, there are Olympic lifting variants to develop power. But again, the, you know, the level of sophistication and skill you need for those is completely different. And in between, there's, there's exercises that build the ability to do the Olympic lifting by the time you get there. So um, for me, that kind of keeps the brain engaged as well. I'm like learning a new skilled pattern as well as getting the, the physical adaptation mm -hmm. but yeah so longer term that's that's the program i put in for that and there's loads of other modules and bits and pieces that that kind of support mm -hmm. that as well um but yeah the uh that's kind of like my all singing all dancing bit and with heavy hitters as well for the first complete 16 weeks of training there's video support calls that we go on um with each person that comes into that as well to make sure i mean not everybody needs it but um those that want it it's proven really useful because it allows me to kind of go in and help them understand exactly how to use all of the the training set up to suit their personal circumstance with their training week. So they're, they're kind of like, well, I do Muay Thai this day, this day and this day. Um, and I have to do, I've got work in this morning here, so I can't put this here. Where, where would I be best to put my training sessions to get the best effect? And we can discuss all of this stuff. If there's any injuries or anything like that, um, we can kind of work around it and I can, other than the, the different variations that we've already got in the program, I can suggest something completely personalized if we need to as well. If there's something we're working around to achieve the same training effect, but without messing up and niggling an injury that's already there, that kind of thing. So that's, that's really what heavy hitters is. And the other programs are kind of subsets that um, are actually modules out of heavy hitters that you can buy independently um, that serve different purposes or lead you a certain, um, distance in your in your progress if you like before things would need to shift again um but i've i've been surprised actually from that as well that there's like you're saying with the the minimum equipment program there there's been a lot more development out of those than i thought people would get <laughs> so i've kind of okay. said you you might get you know it's so with with the minimum equipment program it's it's like that there's three months of structured training there as such um you might get a year out of it if you're if you're good at varying what you're doing and just progressing that as you go through but people are using it for a lot longer than that and still still recording better and better results so that that's great that's 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 really handy to know but it is down to how you're progressing things as well yeah I've j i just finished the I think the power phase the second phase so next week i start the, the speed phase and yeah the, the power and the power phase you have like the the 180 jumps it's still kicking yes. ass. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I still I still haven't been able to do them with one leg. I want to, but so far not yet. So I still feel like there's there's some improvement there. But I have it over a, a year now too, I think. So, right. Yeah. I'm still very happy with it. Might also be because when I was here in Thailand, I was always like preparing and then some fights didn't go through and so I always remained in that speed phase. And then when, when lockdowns happened that's when I started going back to phase one and 
eventually yes. went through it again. So that might have to do with it as well. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know what? That's a really good point, actually. The the whole thing with um with fighting so regularly, especially out in Thailand, it's obviously good for your your um technical and tactical ability getting to fight that often. But in terms of like athletic progress, it can make you get stuck. And that's that's exactly what the ties tend to do anyway. Um almost recycling to get back to the same level of, of fitness and performance as they had for the last fight rather than circling up, circling up, circling up and getting higher and higher mm. and higher. Um, and that's, that's a big thing that um, COVID's actually presented to people is almost like what has given us for the first time in Muay Thai an off season. So we can actually work on getting better rather than just going out and repeating what we did last time effectively and, and then then backing off again and then going back up to where we were last time and backing off again. We can start getting this upward progress. Um, and it's, it's a big challenge actually for, for strength and conditioning is to how can we keep improving performance despite having to peak for fights relatively regularly. Um, mm. And that's, that's something you've got to kind of learn to figure out how to work that in. But as much as possible, I mean, I, I, as you, as you know, if you're on the program there, I like this, um, three to one ratio of loading. So it's three weeks of loading, one week of deload, and then we go into the next block, three weeks of loading, one of deload. So it's like step, step, step up, back off to recover, step, 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 step up, back off to recover. If we can adjust the weeks in the training block there so that the deload lands the week of the fight, we can actually still keep working the progress despite fighting. We're just making sure the deload lands the week of the fight so that um, we get that little peaking effect. And then if we need a bit of time afterwards to take a little while to get back in, depending on how hard we got smashed up <laughs> from the fight itself. And we, then we resume and we go back in and we, we're working the next block and the next block. But it's definitely a lot easier if you haven't got a fight date to peak for and perhaps like a, you know, a weight cut to deal with and all this kind of stuff as well that takes away from your recovery capacity. And we can actually just work on getting stronger, more powerful, faster and relentlessly applying all of that with the endurance as well. So you're not really the biggest fan of fighting quite often because it hinders performance or? It depends on the fighter. So um, I'd say early on, um, more fights is good because getting that experience is the bit that's going to change your performance more than anything. As you get more experienced, obviously, financials aside because you know in thailand if you're you're only getting paid if you're fighting that's that's going to dictate how often you're fighting as well mm -hmm. but for for anyone else that that's not such a bigger deal then um it's more about what how did i perform in my last fight and what did i learn from that and if it's a loss you get more lessons than the wins what can i change before my next fight to make myself better and it's then how long do I need to make those changes before I go out and fight again? Otherwise, I'm just going to repeat the same mistakes. So whether those mistakes are technical and tactical ones and it's like well, there's a habit here that I've ground in and unconsciously I do this. And I need to reprogram this. And I need a load of thousands of repetitions to rewrite this so that I don't think about it. And it happens when I'm fatigued and I don't just revert back to what I did before. I've got to bed in those repetitions. That's going to dictate when you fight again next. But then also, you know, if your limiting factor was something uh, was an athletic quality um mm -hmm. early on it can it can be the cardio side of it it's like i just completely gassed out here um then you need to to train long enough to to actually make that change before you go out and um, repeat the same mistake again so mm -hmm. it, it is completely individual um i'd say the frequency tends to be more fights closer to together when you're when you're earlier in your career and actually, you'd probably benefit from taking a little longer in between fights, which naturally tends to happen anyway, as you get more experience so you can make some changes. Um, mm. And it's a bit bit by virtue as well that, you know, if you're, if you're more of a novice, um, it, repetitions build habits and build motor patterns, build skills and all the rest of it. So if you've, if you've got a clean slate and there's nothing, there's no competing bad habit to, to work against, you can actually learn a new skill very quickly, sort of, uh, sort of three to five hundred repetitions, and it becomes unconscious, and you just do it. If you've done something for three to five hundred repetitions and it hasn't been the best technique, 
then it then takes three to five thousand repetitions to rewrite that unconscious habit again. So someone who's further down the track has probably got more of these repetitions banked in and stuff. If they're wanting to change stuff, even if it's I was talking earlier about being a, you know, a champion who's going back to basics, there'll be little bits in the basics that they overlooked right back at day one and they've banked a bad habit in there. And for them to change it, they need to now do, it's not three to five reps, <laughs> three to 500 reps like a, a beginner would have to, to get that right. They've then yeah. got to rewrite years of habit of doing this. And they, if they want to change this little bit, which is back then wasn't a game changer, but now it's like their limiting factor because everything else is so polished and right. It's this little mm. foundation bit that's wrong. They've now got to go to work on drill, drill, drill. Oh, I've got to revert it back to what I did, right? Drill, drill, drill. I can't, as soon as I'm fatigued, I'll revert back to what I did. And it's like, right, okay, I've got to keep this clean, keep this clean. So that sort of stuff takes, takes a lot of repetition to change. So actually changing some of the habits on a more advanced person can <laughs> be more challenging, believe it or not. Um, before we, we switch over to the mental side of fighting, I have a, there's like this stigma out and it, it's about Conor McGregor and personally I don't agree, but maybe you're more an expert on this. Stigma is that Conor McGregor hasn't got a good conditioning. What do you think of a statement? I think at certain stages of his career, he didn't, or he had less of an effective uh, conditioning. It's, it's a balance. So, um, th this, this is a, uh, a video I did a while ago, actually. So I've, I've got this attitude where we train a hundred percent effort in training so that we boost our hundred percent effort level. If we use a hundred percent effort level by virtue, the fact that it's a hundred percent, you tire very quickly. So the idea actually is when we fight, we're using about 80 to 85% of our maximum all the time. And that way we can just keep it up all day. So if, if you're training, if you're making the mistake of training to a hundred percent and getting used to applying a hundred percent all the time, you're training yourself to kind of gas yourself out and, and, and <laughs> empty your tank too quick. So there's, there's a, a strategy and a tactic to how you pace yourself as well. And that's something you need to learn as an individual. So the idea is we want to train so that our 80% is closer to our opponent's 100% effort. <laughs> so if they, if at your, when you're ticking over, you're 80%, if they're trying to match you, then they're, they're going to gas themselves out, going to lose energy really, really quickly. So that's the reason why we're trained the way we do, but we don't actually want to exhibit that for any uh, extended period in a fight. So you can make yourself appear to have a really poor conditioning just by um, pacing yourself badly, by pushing into your anaerobic system too prematurely and for too long. And you kind of like, ah, oh, I haven't had the effect on my opponent. They, they either managed to weather that storm or yeah. they were actually at their 80% <laughs> while I was giving it 100% and, oh, now I'm dead in the water. So I think there's that, there's that as well. So it's not just um, has your training been too much where you're basically the, the – so with the energy systems, you've got – we spoke about sort of aerobic capacity and aerobic power. That's predominantly where you should be sitting. And if you're ticking over at sort of 80% most of the time with what you're applying and then peaking up and then coming back to that, peaking up and coming back to that, then you can keep that up, up all day. But that that kind of level is um, something that you can sustain, but it's it's not something that you want to be drilling all the time in training in, in terms of the, you know, if you're, if you're pushing beyond aerobic power all the time, you're going into this lactic system. The lactic system doesn't play nice with the aerobic system. So the way the body actually develops is different. So one develops um, where it's like the, um, the mitochondria in the muscle. So they're the, they're the bits providing aerobic energy to the muscle. You build more of those little aerobic power plants in your muscles if you're training aerobically. So you can sustain contractions for longer and keep that level up. If you're training in the lactic system, so you're just burning out all the time, doing very high intensity, as hard as you can, typically beyond 30 seconds, you start to kill off those mitochondria and it's, you start losing the ability to supply energy aerobically. So if you're doing that in your training, you become 
more of a, a lactic animal rather than an aerobic animal <laughs> and you're someone who predominantly gases out so if you've done that in your training and people that do high intensity sprints too much and don't understand how to balance this all up properly they actually turn themselves into a lactic animal that gases out really quick you're actually giving yourself a, sh a short fuse we really want to train fighters to be an aerobic power animal that dips into anaerobic a lactic explosive bits without the lactic acid building up and goes back to aerobic recharge burst recharge burst recharge not burst 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 gas 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 go dead so if you can you can mess up your your energy systems if you've done that and i think at some stage perhaps connor may have done that i don't know because i don't really know what his his training looked like he may have done it where he did too much of the lactic work so he he sort of turned into that but also even if you um aren't training that way if you pace yourself wrong and go that anaerobic for too long and it becomes lactic and you've done that and you've pushed the pace too long and you've used too much of your hundred percent that will make you look like you've got bad conditioning when you've just got poor pacing if you went off to do you know your 10k run and, and went out running like it's 100 meters you know that's what happens you, you look like you've got terrible fitness and you just know <laughs> you just yeah. you didn't judge the distance right do you think there's a, a mental aspect to it as well so this is with him in particular, like, I think he's an amazing fighter, but the one thing that I noticed in, in his fight is like when he, when he can take a fighter out in the first round, you kind of see fatigue on his face after the first round. That's something that I noticed. I might be wrong on this, but I have the feeling that he's kind of like, oh, he's still here. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it, it, it makes it harder fight for Connor, doesn't it? The longer it goes on, yeah. he's, it's, um which might be down to his pacing a bit there and, and his conditioning for it. Um, but also, I mean, he likes, he likes using those unorthodox kind of tricks and things early on, doesn't he, to catch someone. And, you know, it, it, he, that, be, that ability to surprise someone wins fights for him as well. And the ability to surprise someone diminishes as the fight goes on as well. Because like, ah, oh, I've seen this movement, I've seen this movement. And if you're starting to fatigue and apply them a little slower as well, that makes yeah. it harder and harder. So, you know, that's that's part of his style as well, I guess. Mm. Now, we're talking about the mental aspect. Mental training, if you can call it like that, is a big part of fighting. Like, how do you, because you also coach athletes, like how, what, what would be the best way for you to prepare athletes mentally in a fight camp or just in training in general? I, I think the the main thing is um, mentally it's it's about taking responsibility and we kind of mentioned that but it's rather than pushing that responsibility to anybody else mm -hmm. um, yeah. just taking complete one hundred percent ownership for everything that happens because then you can actually do something about it if you're if you're pushing it to external circumstances um, the coach isn't giving me this or I haven't got this facility or I haven't got this going on around me. Um, although some of that might be true, you're actually deciding to train there. So mm -hmm. you could go and find another gym if you wanted to, or, you know, but it's more about you actually making the best of what you've got as well. That once you do that, you start to feel like you're in control of things. And when you're in control of things, you start to feel a lot more motivated. So it's, it is about, um, taking, taking that on yourself and not worrying about something if it is outside of your control. So if it's in your control, do something about it. If it's outside your control, don't sweat it. You know, mm. just like you know, talking about that that first A class pro fight I had, and I got taken down. It's like, up, oh, okay, that that happened. Mm -hmm. There's no point me now dwelling on that psychologically. Going, mm. oh, I can't believe I started that poorly, and it's oh, everyone's watching and that kind of stuff. It's just kind of just well, that's done. I can't control that. That's happened. That's in the past. Forget about it. Mm. The, the the present moment is the only real thing. I'm not going to worry about the future, what's going to happen either. All I can do is control what's happening right now in front of me. Um, and as soon as you kind of focus back in on that, everything kind of gets clearer and easier easier to manage. So I've, I find they're the kind of the main kind of root things you can do in terms of mindset. Um, there's obviously a lot of other things you can sort of work in around. But if you're if you're more focusing on the the present moment and not worrying about stuff you can't control. Um, and taking responsibility for everything that they they go a long long way i think to having the right kind of mindset 
were you particularly nervous before fights or like fearful? Because like I've always been very calm before fights. Like it's only the day off that I get nervous. But I know people who like a week out they they go, <laughs> they go insane, and I'm like already. It's like it's still another week. Yeah, I've I've typically been more nervous. So I okay. I don't know if that's because of perhaps when I was fighting I was already a coach. So I felt there was mm. perhaps more pressure to to do this Maybe. right. <laughs> There's more eyes on me. People were looking up to me. I I don't know if that's that's what it is. But I was always completely honest. Like I might be coaching this stuff and the the techniques and everything, but um, fighting's very different. And I'm learning how to do this now. <laughs> mm. um, so I always kind of had that. But I think I'm always wanting. I'm hoping that I'll do my best. I'm hoping that I'll do my mm. best. And I always had that kind of nervousness for me. It wasn't weeks before. It was just the day of the fight. The mm, day of the fight is kind of like, right, okay. Mm. Oh, I, I hope I'm having a good day today. You know, because mm. there's, there's always that, isn't there? You can just, sometimes you're in the in, training in the gym, aren't you, with, with sparring partners on the pads or whatever. Like, I just can't do anything right today. It's just <laughs> <laughs> everything's, I hope I do not have one of these days. Now I'm fighting. Um, just a day where I'm a complete spanner. But um yeah. I found really a lot of that again, though, is from from the fights I've had. It's it's your mindset. So, you know, you I've never had one of those days in the ring, really thinking about it. Um, anything that's happened that hasn't been right is just because it was the styles of the other the, the fighters, you know, my, my opponents and they messed me up. And it's like, oh, I haven't experienced a fighter who's done this before. And my usual my usual answer for this to, to an opponent isn't working in this instance. I've got to figure this out on the fly. Um, that's been the case. But the if you're feeling prepared for a fight, then it does it goes a long way to kind of quell those nerves. And it's just a case of uh, there was something that um, that Vinny Decon, that that trainer who took me th through the the World Championship fights, he was saying, you know, if if you're nervous, it's it's good. It's shows that you're respecting the situation but also you know it's one of those things that a bit of nerves is useful because when you've got that it means the adrenaline's on so like you're saying but with your shin you know mm. if, if you didn't have some of that going on you're going to feel every little dink and knock and it's going to put you off it, do you yeah. know what i mean i mean <laughs> the, the the way you can fight without shin pads and clatter shin against shin and all that kind of stuff. And you're thinking, how is this not absolutely crucify me yet? Yeah, you can be walking around at home and bang your leg on the corner of a table or something and be like, Oh Jesus, hopping around. And you're like, yeah. and the, the difference is that cortisol, the stress hormones and, you know, being up for it in the moment. So there's, there's a massive power to be had by a bit of nerves. It gives you that, that adrenaline rush. It gives you all of that stuff. It makes you bulletproof. It, it makes you stronger than you would normally be, all this kind of stuff. Mm. You just need to make sure it doesn't tip over into that negative bit where it's now you're just completely rooted and feel tired and heavy. And it's, it's up to you to kind of self-manage that and feel when you're starting to go into mm. that. And I found that didn't tend to happen... It tends to happen more in first fights because you're learning to deal with all of that. But mm. it tends to happen more for more experienced fight, fighters that still get nervous beforehand in the sort of uh, warm-up and preparation before a fight. And you'll just mm. go through these cycles where you're like, yeah, I'm up for it, I'm up for it, I'm bouncing. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And then it's like, oh, I feel so tired. Why do I do this again? I'm feeling knackered. And, you know? <laughs> and then you'll go through, oh, I'm, I'm back up again. And it's, it's understanding what can you do psychologically to – Pick yourself up when you're starting to feel flat just to bring it mm. back into tolerance. But also, by the same token, when you're overdoing it way too early before the fight. And I've seen fighters do that, and I've felt myself doing that. Where I'm like, I'm actually, well, I'm peaking now, and it's it's like an hour before the fight. Wrong. I, I, <laughs> I need to be rein myself back in. I'm feeling, I could fight now, you know? <laughs> like, no, okay. save it, save it. Whip it up, whip it up. So it's... It's then going back to a bit of breathing, relaxing yourself down, just going, it's too early, it's too early, save it, save it, save it. Mm. Um, keep myself a bit calmer. Um, if if I'm doing visualization about the fight and it's making me go, doo, 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 I feel my heart rate going up, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to visualize that right now. I'm just going to do some relaxation stuff now, just, just thinking about my breath and bring that back down again. And save it, mm. save your juice. If 
there's so many people can get burned out with nervous energy way before the fight oh, just yeah, because yeah. they didn't manage that very well. Mm. Yeah, I think in that regard, I was very lucky because like, so my parents, they never wanted me to fight. Like I always wanted, I always wanted to box when I was a little kid. But my, my mom was like, no, you're always, your nose is going to be ugly. And I was like, oh, uh, soccer then, I guess. But I, I, I just got bored. Like, soccer is so boring. <laughs> so eventually I got into MMA. And I told my parents it was like karate because I did karate when I was a young kid for like years. But right. I couldn't, co- the same thing, I couldn't compete. They were like, no competing. And I was like, Ugh. So I did MMA. And so they found out on television what MMA was. But they saw like the most gruesome slaughter as you can imagine, like a guy elbowing from a mound, so there was blood, and they were like, are you doing this? And I was like, yeah. And so they're like, okay, okay, but don't compete, okay? And then eventually, I, I was like a, a bad gym and a bad coach, I just left. But like competing in, in Belgium, was kind of, you had to wear shin guards, and I was like, I don't, I don't want to compete. I don't want to look like a transformer when I fight. This is not what I signed <laughs> up for. So I was like, okay, I have to go to Thailand. So I came here. And so I wanted to, I knew I was going to fight. And my parents knew too. It was like, you know, the elephant in the room. But so they didn't know when I was going to fight because I was so far away. So somebody posted the poster on Facebook and my brother or my niece must have seen it. And they, have, they, sh- they showed it to my parents. And so my, two days before my first fight, my mom sent me a message and was like, yeah, there's this dude in, in London. I, I was in UK and he died in the ring. She sent me that. And I was like, God damn it. Two days before my fight. Um, yeah. And so I was like, well, it's better to face reality now than, than face it before I have to fight because that, that would be bad timing. So I, I just asked myself the question. I was like, well, am I willing to die in the ring? And I was like, well, I've beaten depression. I've beaten suicidal tendencies. Like I have the, the worst behind me already. And then I was like, I had a job that I hated. Like I hated that job. I was like a desk job. And I was like literally looking at YouTube videos of people competing in Thailand, I was like, you know what? Yeah, fuck it. Mm-hmm. And that gave me like this kind of peace. And after, after a fight, so I won. And two days later, I, I just got curious and I Googled it. And I was like a 50 year old Mexican wrestler that died in the ring. I was like, Jesus, give me context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad was, um, always up for, for for me fighting he wanted to mm. box when he was younger but his mum wouldn't let him so okay. he didn't do that so he was mm. of that mindset anyway and that's that's kind of what i was exposed to as a kid you know my, my dad's kind of attitude there which i guess why I love, i've always loved contact sports and stuff like that mm. but my mum as as mothers tend to be was like i don't like you fighting and all this kind of stuff <laughs> um and i actually remember um, it was actually one of those those fights in Tottenham that my parents came to watch me for the first time. So I'd been doing it for a few fights, and they, my dad was like, "I want to come and see you fight," and Mum kind of reluctantly came along as well. And they're both, I could see them sat at ringside, and um, I'm like warming up for my fight. And literally, I think it was like two or three fights before mine, I just glanced out of the dressing room bit just to have a little look, and I could see this guy had just been knocked out literally sparked out on the canvas laying stretched out right in front of my mum and she's just looking at him and I'm like oh this is not not what I needed before I fought <laughs> and as you can see she's like not happy not happy about this <laughs> but then but then I fought and um she she saw basically that I was giving as good as I got that I was defending myself I guess she had it in her head it was going to be like a rocky movie where it's like do, do, do. I was getting hit in the head and then I yeah. hit him in the head and <laughs> but it was it, of course not like that um yeah. and the, 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 there was some um, defensive skill to it and um mm. you know that that guy did get knocked out but it <laughs> it doesn't happen to everybody and it's not like a it, it can be like one shot can't it not not like um you're spending the whole fight like Rocky just getting smashed in the head the whole fight preferably um, not it, yeah preferably not <laughs> But yeah, the, after after that, she was actually fine. She was fine with me okay. fighting because she'd seen me do it. Um, but uh, yeah, I can understand <laughs> the the reluctant parents when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> now you have a, a son yourself too, right? Yes, son and daughter. You, yeah. Oh, son and daughter. Would you would you allow your kids to to fight? Yes. Yeah, and okay. they both did. They both did train when they were younger. 
Um, okay. But uh, yeah, got well. It's interesting because my my son was very into the training, and he looked really promising. Actually, he looked really okay. good, but he was so introverted that when it came to just doing like an interclub and non decision fight or something, um, just completely hated the fact that he was up on a stage and everyone's watching. Um, okay. And he just he didn't. He didn't do what he could do. He loved sparring and training and was like, looked like a little monster. It's like, he's, okay. he's got something here, but he just mm. did not enjoy getting in the ring and doing that. And, um, I said to him at the time, you know, he said that, you know, this is, this is what I enjoy doing. And I actually enjoy yeah. the, the test of being in the ring. That's where I really, I find that's the, the big test. How productive has my training been? And also the, the psychology of it all. That's where you really get to know yourself there, what, how you really react. But he really wasn't enjoying that part of it at all. Okay. I said, you know, if you this this is my thing. It's not what my parents did, you know, and, and or or even any of my friends do. I've got new friends that do this now, but not, none of the ones I grew up with are in into this. They don't understand it either. It's, everyone's got different things they're into. Um, if you enjoy the training, you can just do the training. If you don't, then don't feel you have to do it just to please me. You know, this this is what I enjoy doing. Um, so. Eventually, he well, he <laughs> he was running for a while. He really enjoyed racing, um, but he's always, always his first word was car. <laughs> he loves cars, okay. <laughs> so um, he he for he managed to get on a, a birthday um, event where um, one of his friends was doing go karting. So he did that, and it was like, oh, I want to do this. So he we we actually had him doing go karting for a while. We couldn't afford for him to buy a cart and do all that kind of stuff. It gets really bloody expensive quickly, but yeah, in terms probably. of using. <laughs> in terms of using the, uh, the, the the carts that were there at the track, um, he was doing that and and got on really well with that. But that's what he really loved doing. Um, okay. But my daughter, um, she she wants to be a, a professional dancer. That's what she wants to do. So um, my daughter, Amber, she was funny. In the training, um, she didn't want to do any of the training, didn't want to do pad work or anything else. She just wanted to do sparring. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, no, that's not not the way it works. works. Like, mm, mm, not interested then. So okay, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. So um, yeah, but but she she found um, classical ballet, uh, and okay. she really got in really got into that. She did gymnastics for a bit because she liked doing that. Then then found mm -hmm. classical ballet and really enjoyed that. And that's that's ultimately what she wants to do: classical ballet and contemporary dance. But it's, I've. I mean, I've even been asked when the kids were at different schools and stuff. They once the uh, teachers know what you do, they're like, "Oh, we've we've got a, a health and well-being week. Can you come in and do some Thai boxing with the kids? You know, so you sort of bring all the pads in and they all have a little go." Um, and I've I've always it's been interesting with the kids because you can see there's there's the kids that class themselves as sporty, and there's the ones that don't. And you you're up there and you demonstrate something, and um, you can see they're like, we get to hit something, you know, especially when they're younger, like we're told yeah. never to hit anything, you know, and it's like, oh, this looks good. And even the yeah. kids that aren't sporty, like, I'm up for this. And because mm. it's um, because it's a solo sport or a solo activity, I think that's where it's really useful that you get the kids that aren't don't consider themselves sporty because they don't want to let down the team by being the weak link and all the rest of it. But when it comes to going up and having a little go at something themselves, you can see there's this little little spark. You know, they're like, I like this. Um, and I, and I'm, I say to the kids, you know, as part of this health and well-being week or whatever it is, they do all these little tasters on different things. Um, so try all these different things out. Because I said, you know, if if I thought all sport was like cricket, I wouldn't be interested in sport either. You know, it's just not for me. I'd get bored. You know, there's not enough going on. There's There's apart from when you're batting, there's not a lot of risk going on and that doesn't, mm. oh, I need that as well. I need a bit of adrenaline to it, you know, and, um, I've settled on Muay Thai. That's the one that ticks all the boxes for me. Um, try different things out and find out what, what lights your fire and it's going to be unique to you, you know? Um, and then you'll find you'll be happy to be active doing it or whatever it is or whatever level. But, um, yeah, so I've, I've encouraged them that they just came along and did what, well, what I was doing, but also my wife does it as well. So she, she's a fighter as well. Um, we were both doing it, so they wanted to come and join in, but, uh, mm -hmm. we were very much, you know, just, just do what, whatever floats your boat, not what suits us. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I like the idea of that because a lot of parents, they like, they don't allow that. 
but also don't you think that schools would benefit for from like showing more sports to your kids because for example i remember when i went to to high school and i think before that is elementary school and the only sports we did were like soccer badminton tennis rugby but you couldn't go too hard so kind of got boring dancing yeah it's like everybody like everybody in belgium knows boxing like we all know it but it's like oh don't do that that's that, that's a sport for like poor people or you know mm. like just come from the street and it's like there are actually a lot of benefits to like combat sports if if you're in the right gym yes yeah that and that's the thing i think i was exactly the same when i think it's a bit different now um when i've seen my my kids go through their here in the uk the gcses the different kind of um disciplines and things they can play around with even in even in the the pe sessions the physical education sessions it's a little bit more varied to give them a bit more of a, a taster but i guess it's with a syllabus they're always being kind of governed back to these standard for most people boring sports you know some some people are, are into them but mm. if 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 that is your thing great if it's not you're completely turned off by it um mm -hmm. one of the i think it is changing now but I, I think in schools it's it would be better if they kind of focused on like we do with the strength and conditioning programs it's more about how you move um, and competing mm -hmm. against yourself to get better rather than it always being team sports and having to beat them and or being picked or not and all this kind of stuff as soon as you kind of turn it into you're not competing with anyone else other than yourself what can you do um and this is this we can play with this to make you better and they're like ah oh, okay i did get better at this i didn't think i could but i can do this and there's mm -hmm. different people with different levels of ability um but a lot of that time um different levels of ability come from different levels of practice so if you happen to have played as a kid i mean i was a really physical kid with with my play you know outdoors climbing trees and running around and all this kind of stuff and throwing and catching stuff all the time um that transferred over into different sports that i i had a go at it's like oh it's all right for you you're a natural athlete but actually looking back now understanding um what's referred to as the long-term athletic development model um how how um athletes can be developed from young ages right through to adults and, and professional sports there are certain windows of opportunity that present at different age groups um and it's it's not chrono chronological age, it's the physiological age. So d maturity happens with different kids, different rates, boys and girls are all different. Um, but there are windows of opportunity for agility, hand-eye coordination, strength, aerobic systems, um, all these kind of things. They, they, they come and go. And if you happen to, like, I was really lucky, looking back at it, what was I doing at these different ages? I was doing things that developed the right things in the right windows before they'd gone. So when I was working flexibility or um, w when uh, a flexibility window came up, I happened to be doing things that, that actually tapped into that. When mm -hmm. the aerobic window cropped up, although I wasn't doing a lot of sports at school, I had a paper round here and I was on my push bike mm -hmm. cycling and I'd always try and get around my, I was stupid, trying to race around my paper round to do it as quickly as I could. And there was, mm -hmm. there was even like a, there was one hill I always had that had a, um, at that time in the morning, there was an, an electric milk float that would go up the hill and he would see me coming in his rear view mirrors and I'd hear him go and he'd, he'd try and floor it so I couldn't get past him. And I'd come past him on this hill and I was always having stupid little races like this. So I was doing lots of little um, aerobic um, conditioning drills every morning for my paper round. And that was when I look at the age group, that was like perfect for for that aerobic window. So I developed all the right things at the right time and it, and it kind of made me more of a natural athlete. But I think there's a lot of mm. kids that get turned off by what they're doing so they don't do anything. And then yeah. that window of opportunity to naturally develop these things has mm. come and gone. A bit like, you know, it's easier to pick up a second language when you're younger than when you're older. It's, it, you can do it, but it's just harder. And it's the same, same with adults. I see a lot of adults that come to me in the gym um, whether they're training Muay Thai or not, they'll struggle with certain movement patterns. They just, you know, some people you show them and they just go, boom, got it. And I can mm. see like, yeah, I can see how you played as a kid. You know, <laughs> I can see what, what sort of things you did. And there's the term sort of 
bit disrespectful, but you call it like a motor moron, someone who's got a pattern that they just haven't touched. So you yeah. get them to do it as an adult and they just cannot coordinate it at all. Um, mm. and, and it's literally because they just didn't have that. They either didn't do that particular sport when they were a kid, didn't play in a certain way when they were a kid, and that, that mm. window of opportunity has come and gone. And now as an adult, the body's going, how the hell do I coordinate this pattern of movement? You know, mm. whereas your natural athlete who was throwing sticks at animals or whatever yeah. <laughs> had, has, has kind of developed good punch mechanics. Whereas if you didn't do that kind yeah. of stuff, you, you haven't, you know, so it's, it's, I find that fascinating. It's funny that you mentioned that because it was, I was thinking about that recently because I posted something on my Instagram about being in shape and somebody directed and, and they went like, well, you just have good genetics. And I was like, no, I don't. Like, I was the skinniest kid in class for, like, a long time. Like, a very long time. And But I always, maybe like you said, I always just picked on the right sport. I had, like, swimming, karate, for hip dexterity. It was amazing. I still have very flexible hips. I did skateboarding, soccer, indoor soccer. So, like, different kind of um, cardio workouts. And then I did fitness, which might have been bad because I was kind of, like, a wooden board. Because, right. yeah. But after that, once... Once I went to MMA and went into MMA and grappling, I picked it up like this. I was like, once yeah. my body became loose, of course, because yes. in the beginning I, I was I was stuck because of the, the the two three years of like lifting heavy, and that was that, right. that's why also why I don't really like to lift. Yeah, yeah, it's when I when I first went from American football to martial arts practice when I did that transition, um, I I was nice and explosive, could do all that kind of stuff. But my flexibility, hamstrings weren't too bad out the front. So I could do like a, a nice high teep, relatively high. But out to the side adductors, I had no mobility there. I just hadn't been using that. That was something I hadn't hadn't really tapped into. So that took a bit of work. Um, but that that quickly that quickly came around once I actually focused on it. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? What what does carry over and what doesn't? Um it's and you, you definitely see that with, with different people. And even, you know, people say about, you know, will the, the fact that I've trained in other martial arts, will it kind of negatively impact me now doing Muay Thai and stuff like that? And it's like, well, if you've been doing movements, those movements will come across really nicely. You'll pick stuff up. The bit that you have got to look at is then what habits have you drilled in that we need to change because the rule set of what you're doing doesn't suit the rule set of Muay Thai. And that's that's all it is. So, for example, I mean, when I, because I didn't do Muay Thai originally, I did, it was, all I had around me was freestyle kickboxing and Taekwondo. That's what I did. And it was, that was my stop gap until a Muay Thai gym turned up, you know, and that was available. And then I was there. That was it. Oh, yeah, this, this ticks all the boxes now. I'm happy with this. But I had the habit of kicking and landing with my instep, you know, so kicking with the shin for me took a lot of drilling to change that distance so that I wasn't kicking in a tie style, which was just spraining my own ankle every time I caught a leg or a body or anything like that. <laughs> I was just twisting my own ankle every time, not using my shin like a baseball bat. But the, the kick mechanics I had were, were subtly different as well. It was more of a knee extension, all that kind of stuff. But I very quickly adjusted that. But there's stuff like the, uh, the shin contact that needed to be, to be adjusted. But it's, it's just being willing to persevere on that kind of stuff. And the, the root mechanics of the movement meant I picked it up quicker anyway. So I'd never be sort of too worried about doing too much of other stuff if you wanted to transition over. It's mm -hmm. like movement's a movement, and it's just up to you to then sort of recalibrate to suit the rule set that you've got. Mm, yeah. Yeah, like I never saw karate as like a bad thing. I mean, the only thing that I did was hop, like karate car. That was the only thing where people went like, oh, God. <laughs> So that sort of bounce, 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 bounce. Yeah, the bounce like uh, up and down and then back and forth because of yes. the, the years of, of sparring like that. But, you know, it's like I still use that. Like mm. it catches people by surprise when you fake with it. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like with with anything. I mean, we I think we're seeing more of it in Muay Thai these days. But it, um, th there's more techniques being blended in now that aren't looking like traditional Muay Thai and it's surprising people and catching them out because it looks unorthodox and the timing's yes. different. It's when it's punctuated in the right way. If it's overused all the time, if you're bouncing all the time, you're just going to get 
timed for a low kick and turned, aren't oh, you? Yeah. Both feet are yeah. off the floor. So, but a little bit every now and then can kind of give you that plyometric bounce to set something up, else up a bit different and catch people out. So it's it's how you use it, isn't it? Not just yeah. if you're using it. Yeah. It's how, how does Barry Robson say this again? How, when, how? I think it's something like that. I wrote it down. But it's like, because most people they just throw, but he's like, oh, when? When you throw it? How do you throw it? Why do you throw it? Yeah. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's if you boil everything down to that, that's it. It gives you a really good framework, right? Uh, it, it makes you question everything as well. So a, a bit like we're going back to what we're talking about, different people showing you different techniques. Um, it's like, why are you using this different, different technique and when <laughs> rather than just how you're doing it? Um, and that's, that's the real true understanding then. So they're really good questions to have in, in the back of your mind the whole time whenever you're learning anything. Yeah. Okay, we just, we just hit two hours. This was an amazing conversation. Have we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> this was uh, very interesting. Where can people find you? Well, the best, best place to, to, to find me is on my website. That's just heatrick.com. So I'll spell that. It's okay. H-E-A-T-R-I-C-K.com. Um, that's kind of like my hub where everything is. So there's, there's all the, all the kind of articles, um, videos, podcasts, and, and the guides are all on there. And then if people are wanting to do more, there's, there's the, uh, the programs that I offer as well, but there's a ton of information that is just on the website that people can find me, uh, on there links off to the social media as well from there. So that's kind of like the best place as a single source. Okay. What's the best way that people can get a contact with you, your website or yeah, um, probably the, the most reliable way is actually through Instagram these days. So message me on Instagram, and that's all linked off the website as well. But yeah, email's good, and there's links there. to that off the, off the, yeah, okay. off the website. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, pleasure to speak to you, to get a proper chance to speak to you as well, rather than just sort yeah. of messages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get to know the man behind the Instagram. <laughs> Oh, still getting to grips with all that, you know. <laughs> Technolo technology is weird. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's, it's different platforms have different styles, don't they, and all the rest of it are kind of um, yeah. al always trying to take whatever I'm doing and, and present it in a way that seems to work on that platform. But Instagram definitely seems to be the place where the fighters are at the moment. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah. The, the most popular place. That's where you get all your sponsorships if you, if you do it right. Yeah, it seems to be, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's actually true. CBD. Yeah. Meal companies. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen it all from others. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to 